The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, Church Planner, welcome to the sponsorless Church Planner Podcast. (laughs) Wait, 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 wait. Mo give. (laughs) M-O-G-I-V. <laughs> What's funny is how many church plants I still see using MoGiv, and I know they started because of the podcast. Absolutely. Guys, it's it's time to switch over. I won't tell you to switch over too, because they're not sponsoring us. Oh, my gosh. Services out there. We're like the worst hosts ever. Don't ever sponsor with those guys, because once you quit, wow, man, there's just no going back. <laughs> I, I remember when we were sponsoring them, you were like the secret tither, remember? Oh, yeah. And you would show up and you would like make these flash donations to people only if they had MoGiv. Well, people would put out things on Facebook and I'd be like, well, I got a little bit of extra scratch this month. I, I need to I need to make it go somewhere. I'll go. Oh, no MoGiv. They're out. Uh, I remember. You lost it. And I remember you saying that. And all of a sudden, like the MoGiv subscriptions jumped up. I remember uh, on Facebook, I just put some comment up. Oh, they don't have MoGiv, like underneath someone who was asking, and you just go, "Oh, they just lost out." <laughs> <laughs> oh, so funny, so funny. So, what's new with you, man? Well, you know what? Uh, nothing too new with me. Um, church planning, of course, that's always growing. I uh, have been meeting with. Um, different business owners in the area talking about possibilities of, of using space. Two guys are starting up a brewery here in Oceanside. So that could be a possibility. Could be starting up a, a church plant there. I guarantee I'm, you, if it's just two regular guys starting up a brewery, that thing is going down real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but long enough for us to plant our church out of it. That, yeah. Hey, hey. That, that's got to be one of the hardest things in the world to start up, especially down there where there's like a million breweries. Well, dude, you got Stone Brewery, which is like the uh, the mecca. Dude, I was in I was in two places once, and I saw guys. Once I was in Europe, I was actually in in the Netherlands, going through Schiphol Airport, and I saw guys with like bottles of beer, like filled up in this duffel bag. And they had made a pilgrimage. Then once I was in D.C. This is in the last couple of years. So people like make pilgrimages. If you've never been to the Stone Brewery uh, headquarters and been to their ginormous beer garden, it's like a like little mini city. It's like Disneyland. It's incredible. You got waterfalls. And it's it's a it's it's pretty cool, dude. You just got to Google Stone Brewery Escondido. So I got kind of a funny story that I've been dying to tell you all week. Oh, that's right. I, I was like, man, we got to get off the phone because you're you're not going to make it. No, I knew I was going to make it because to me, this is too good of a story. <clears throat> and I don't know that our listeners are going to truly, truly appreciate this. First of all, guys, if let, you were, let me let me say this before we start, guys, welcome to Church. I was just going to say that, especially for the new listeners. If you're new, this is smack talk. We do not just get straight in. We figure we make you earn it. Right. It's like the opposite of your salvation. You got to earn this. Right. Saving Private Ryan, you know, our dying words to you are earn this. And you got to earn the church planning goodness by waiting through our smack talk. So <clears throat> if if you've been a longtime listener of the show and and unfortunately uh, for a couple of our listeners, they've reported to us that they've listened to every episode at least twice. Uh, some more than that, and I, I feel for them <laughs> if they've put themselves through that. But if you've been a longtime listener, you know that Peyton and I, neither one of us are Trump supporters. Uh, neither one of us are Republicans or Democrats. We are independents. Um, I myself, speaking for myself only here, am such a hardcore conservative 
that I can't stand either party because to me they're pretty much no different. So I say that it, it's important for you to understand. <clears throat> I did not vote for Trump. I voted for a third party candidate. I don't even remember who it was, but I just wasn't going to waste my vote on either anybody one. but those two knuckleheads. Yeah, that, I wasn't going to do it. Right. So I'm I'm going into the story with that. You got to understand that's where I'm coming from. So <clears throat> Monday or Tuesday, I don't remember what day it was. I'm like, I think it was Monday. I'm like, you know what? Taxes are almost due. I need to do my taxes. And and I do them myself. And I do them myself because I, I used to do taxes. So it's not like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. Though I'm not a CPA or an enrolled agent. You do my taxes. No, yours are too complicated. They are really complicated. Ministers' taxes are very complicated. But you know what? Uh, TurboTax does do ministers. What? Oh, yeah. They do not. Oh, yeah, because one of the questions they'll ask you, was any of this income because you were a minister? No way. Oh, yeah. Then they're like, yeah, we can't help you. So if you follow through with that link. <laughs> no. So so here's the deal, man. I'm doing my taxes. Now, something you got to understand when if you're not self-employed, you, you may not understand this, but as a self-employed person, and I technically am self-employed, uh, because uh, I've got an LLC that's owned by both my wife and myself. So that's uh, considered self-employed uh, to the IRS, to the feds. So I'm, I'm doing my taxes. And uh, when you're self-employed, you do what's called quarterlies, right? You pay your quarterly taxes. So if you've got a regular W-2 job, you may not realize that even though they're taking your money out of your paycheck for Uncle Sam and the state... They actually don't turn that over until uh, quarterly, and uh, and then they got to pay their share because they're whatever you pay, they're also paying as well. Right. So when you're self-employed, you pay both of those. So your taxes are they really seem high because you're you're actually seeing what's getting paid. And um, I for the last several years, because uh, you know I, I've been making really good money, I pay my quarterlies. So for the first time in my life, uh, you know, this is going on five years or so that I've been paying quarterlies. I, I haven't really worried at tax time, like in no matter how much more I owe. Right. Because that's the whole thing is when you're self-employed, you're always going to owe more. You, you just don't get refunds. It's not how it works. <laughs> it never works that way for us. So I'm not worried about it. Right. Because I literally paid just a grip of money. Uh, in taxes last year in my quarterlies. Well, you remember how Trump did that tax reform act and he changed the taxes starting in yeah. 2018? Yeah. I'm doing my taxes. And I kid you not, I have a $25,000 refund coming my way. Oh, man. And all I can do is go onto Amazon, buy a 12 pack of MAGA hats. I'm handing them out left and right. <laughs> Trump 2020, baby. Trump 2020. <laughs> I'm like, I, I can't believe this miracle. That's I'm like, amazing. Dude, I, I don't even like the guy. I've never voted for the guy. And I'm like, Trump 2020. I'm getting MAGA hats. I'm telling you. You know, he might be dumb on Twitter, but he's certainly not dumb. On some of the stuff he's doing, if you wanted to stay in office, that's what that's what you need to do in America. I, I mean, I knew this years ago. If you, you know, I'm convinced that the to reason someone out is to screw their taxes up. The reason why Clinton won a second term, because remember everything that happened in the first term. Yep. I mean, Paula Jones, the whole thing, all that stuff going on in the first term. <clears throat> the reason why he won a second term is right before the election, he raised the national speed limit from 55 miles an hour to 65 miles an hour. And I'm telling you, everyone was like, oh, yeah, homeboy yep. gets my vote. Yep. You affect people right where it counts. Dude, absolutely. Hit him in the pocketbook. All I can I say is Trump is, the, though, a certifiable. <clears throat> Trump, is an, Trump is an absolute idiot. Like yeah. attacking John McCain, who's been dead for months now. That's what I'm saying is whatever he says is idiotic, but a lot of what he does. Is I'm kind of wondering, is he like, you know, dementia going on? 
Well, you you got to wonder because who in you, their right mind attacks a dude who's dead? Right, and and a war veteran, a and war a guy veteran, with a brain tumor, POW and camp survivor, a guy who's as well loved by both sides of the political spectrum. Well, it's because he was more of a Democrat than a Republican. So, of course, sorry, that's my. Uh, I really like this coming out. I liked his balance, to be honest. I like oh, McCain. I didn't. Yeah. I don't like anyone who has balance. I want you to be conservative. <laughs> be way over there so far that everyone's like, uh, we're not going to get a dime out of that guy. <laughs> that's that's the politician that I'm voting for right there. Man, that's hilarious. Dude. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. All, all I can say is Trump 2020. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, make Pete's taxes great again. <laughs> What's so funny is I'm like telling Jamie as I'm like doing the taxes, I'm like, no, I should still be upset about the fact that they still stole tens of thousands of dollars from me in taxes. But I can't help but be excited because I'm actually getting money back. And a lot of it. Yes. That's a lot America, of money. America giveth and America taketh away. I could buy another car. Hey, do you wow. still want that charger? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> As a matter of fact, D- donate it to a new breed. It'll be another write off. What? Write off. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> it's my work vehicle. Oh, then you get to write off every mile as well. <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> yeah, so that was my big story for the week. Dude, that's awesome, man. That's super. That's good news. I, yeah, I haven't finished the taxes. I estimated Jamie's, so it was thirty thousand. The one I estimated what I'd owe for her went down to twenty five. I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow, dude, that's me, amazing. Me not so, having to write them another check—that's amazing. <laughs> like, it's so funny, man, because you and I were chatting this week, and I was laughing about you know. I just happened to be—I don't remember what I was working on. I just happened to listen to a bunch of our um, podcasts, yeah, podcasts, and as I. Uh, as I was listening, I listened to that one where you were really grumpy because you, you got sick in Solvang. That should have been the title. The one about being sick in Solvang. Wait, wait. There's only one with me grumpy? <laughs> no, but this was like extra grumpy. That was the one where you, you, you're you looking at the video and you go, what's up with your sweatshirt? Like, you've been grumpy all – and then I, I called you out. I'm like, dude, what's wrong? Like, are you grumpy about that? And you're like, I'm sick. <laughs> but I think I remember you were wearing like some communist shirt. It was a Deftone shirt, and you're right. It does kind of – what it is, it was an album cover, but it was in red. It doesn't look communist if, if it's not in red. It was silver. It's a horse with a star. And uh, you're like, what is that? Are you chi? Like, what's up? <laughs> so it's pretty funny. <laughs> che or whatever, in Guevara or whatever. <laughs> so uh, fist in the air in the land of hypocrisy. Yeah. So anyways, um, yeah, man, but I I did notice, this is where I'm getting to, I did notice you were especially chipper this week, and now I know why. Dude, it's pretty hard to bring me down off of that one. I thought it was like the post, you know, St. Patrick's Day, you're like, this is the time of my people, like you get an energy boost whenever the red-haired people come out. You know what's funny is I did not know that Protestants were orange and Catholics were green. So yeah. I'm kind of wondering why are we always wearing green then? Like it's tr- it doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. Well, because the Catholics dominate Ireland. I mean, well, they must dominate is- America too because everyone here is wearing green. Well, it's funny because when you go to Ireland, it's not a thing. St. Patrick's Day. Well, of course not. It, it, it's an American thing. Like you guys all got to know that. You know, listeners. Over there, I lived in Wales, and they're like, yeah, St. Patrick's Day. Like, what's up with you guys with that? Like, you guys aren't Irish? And I'm like, well, you know, a lot of people claim Irish heritage, and they're like, oh, yeah, you guys are funny about that. They, I mean, they laugh when they see Americans going, this is my clan, and this is my kilt. They just are like, <laughs> you know, they just they crack up at us. They just think we're the weirdest people. They're like, yeah, whatever, you know. Well, you know what my response to that always is, without fail. Don't really care. Back to back World War champs over here. We can do what we want, baby. Do what we want. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that is true. Remember that time we uh, we 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 got some hate mail for Britain. Remember that? Which time? Yeah, that guy he got real mad at you for talking about guns. 
No, he came to you. It didn't come to me. Oh, yeah, that's right. He was, he he was, was like, I expected better of you, Peyton. He, he was like the guy who goes to the pastor's wife to, like, complain about the pastor, hoping that the pastor's wife will take it over to the pastor. And, you know, hey, uh, people in the church are saying this. He just didn't realize <laughs> I don't that. think this, but I just thought you should know that people are saying. You know, for me, it was kind of like, like the song I referenced, which is kind of my, yeah, whatever. Because this is my United States of whatever. That's like my favorite song right now. And that goes in my head. My wife will be like, hey, can you take out the trash? I'm like, yeah, whatever. If you I, have not heard that song, you have to go listen. I have listen. no idea what you're talking about. Liam Lynch, United States of whatever. The best song ever. I have no idea so, what it is. No. Yeah, I was hanging out in a corner and Officer Kuminski came up to me and said, hey, punk, I thought it. Yeah, whatever. That's the whole song. Just him saying whatever to everybody. Yeah. I don't think we need to go on the cop topic. <laughs> I was at a police meeting last night. You were? Yeah. What were you guys discussing? It was, there was a homeless person, uh, two homeless people that murdered a 50 something year old woman in my neighborhood. And, um, now, which, why was she out jogging? Was it? No, dude. It was like, they, they broke into her house. They oh, were, really? they were camped out at a park down the street. Guess broke who's getting the firearm? You? Oh my God, huh? Dude. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, that might have come up in conversation with the missus, who <laughs> missus has been very resistant to that over the years. And last night she was like, you know, I, I just start to kind of move that way. You know, I'm going to have you, you wearing like the plate carrier. You're going to have like <laughs> seven mags across the front, carrying an <laughs> hey, AR-15, the, the pistol on the side. Oh, yeah. I think you just got to go bandoliers, big mustache and a sombrero. That's just to me, like Clint Eastwood, Poncho, you know, hiding everything. You got to go all out. A couple of six shooters, one for each hip. It's going to be awesome. Dude, seriously, like I do want to go to Texas and see all the cowboys walking around in suits and big hats packing heat. That's got to be, that's got to be kind of cool. But it's only in certain parts of Texas. Yeah. The free parts. Because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, blue areas there. Yeah, see, I don't even know what that stuff means. But anyways, it was funny, man. When I got that hate mail, I did ignore it, and I didn't care. It, it was kind of like, yeah, whatever. But I figured he was more mad because we were we were ripping a bit on British people. And I love British people. I lived there 12 years. But, hey, if you can't – this is what my wife always says about me because she knows I hate people. And, like, if I'm ministering, like, literally like the Apostle Paul, I take great comfort in the fact that Paul hated people, Right. Like that was that was his thing. You know, he hated people, but when the, he says, "For the love of Christ compels us," like Christ loved through him. Jesus, Paul was not great. There was nothing good in himself. I, I definitely that that's definitely the case. I hate this ministerial culture where we're always trying to impress people with who we are. Mm. And I, I'm I'm so like I got over that years ago. It's like no, there's nothing good in me. I don't love you. Uh, if if I love you, that's a miracle of God. That is the Holy Spirit at work in me, and that is Jesus' love channeling through me. I'm not naturally going to love you. So when I do this podcast, like, over the years, that is totally God. That is totally God loving. Like, I love church planners, but I know that's the Lord because I'm as selfish as anyone. Ask my wife how selfish I am. I, I typically hate people. But here's the deal. If you can't, hate everyone equally, then that's prejudice. So I, just full disclosure, I hate everybody. If I get close enough to any culture, I'm going to start hating them too, right? Because you see people, you see them for what they are, kind of like it was where it says like Jesus, you know, they went to make him king, but he would not entrust himself to them for he knew what was in men. <laughs> it's like that, I know what's in men. I'm very aware. I drive. I'm on the freeway. I know how people are. I hate you. But when I have to minister to you, the Holy Spirit comes through. And then I love you. And then I'm like, whoa, that's weird. You know? And and years ago, I realized that's totally God. Because I know me. I just think, you know, people need to be real about that. You know? I hate this idea where it's like, oh, I feel bad because I don't love people. Yeah, no, you're a sinner. Mm. And anything good in you is God at work in you. Unless you're just one of those people where you're just a nice person. I don't understand that, but okay. 
Yeah, I don't care if you are a nice person though, because uh, I mean, th- this is this is my life verse. You're making me pull out the Bible. Look at that. Did you have you ever seen that one happen on a podcast before? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you actually. It, no, yes, I have. <laughs> Here, here's my life verse: Psalm sixteen two. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And I wrote, mm. that's me. It's all highlighted. I'm like, look, that's me. I see myself in that, in that verse. I can see my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, those happy people, let's just face it. Deep down inside, they got like uh, 16 kids chained up in their basement. They're evil. <laughs> They're just faking it on the outside. When they go to bed, they go to bed, they lay their, 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 uh, you know, um, heads. their their heads on their four hundred ply weave pillow, Egyptian cotton, and they think, "Man, I am awesome. I am so nice. I had an awesome day. God's sure lucky to have me. <laughs> God's sure lucky to have me." But but when you and I go to bed, we just go. Sorry about today, Lord. <laughs> yes, that's pretty much it. Um, God, I, I really need more of Jesus. And uh, thank you for your grace and love and mercy. And uh, Lord, I'll see you in the morning because I'm going to need you. Yeah. <laughs> so, or it'll that's start gotta with be, that's uh, got to be okay. Or, or, or my prayers will start with God, I got so much shame. I don't even feel like I can approach you right now. True story. Yeah. I mean, that's just yeah. the re- when that's you're being everybody. honest with yourself, it's kind of like, and I've mentioned this before on the podcast. There's that great line in, uh, I think it's the Avengers, probably like the first one, Um, but uh, uh, what's the chick's name, the redhead chick? Uh, Black Widow. Black Widow. Black Widow. And that's from a DC guy, by the way. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's Avengers. Come on. Everybody's an Avenger now. Oh, yeah. You got to love them. Black Widow goes, yeah, I got a lot of red in my ledger. Like, she's trying to do good to outdo the red. And all I can say to that is, yeah, but when you really realize that you can never undo the red, like, it doesn't matter how much good you do, the red is permanent. It never comes out. That's when you realize the only way I can ever be made clean is by Jesus because I can't get rid of the red. I can't go, oh, yeah, I really screwed up, hurt those people, whatever. I'm going to yeah. do good from now on. Doesn't work, man. Not when you really yeah. understand how the red works. Doesn't Dude, work. I, you know, this one, the topic I was planning on doing today, but I think, I think <laughs> we just nailed our topic. I think, honestly, for a church planner, how do you, you know, you're preaching grace to, to everyone else. How do you preach grace to yourself? You know, how do you, how do you work all that through? I, th- I think that's our topic today, Pete. Uh, Great, Scott. It's time for this week's topic. <laughs> Let's get down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> that was so great. You got this look on your face like, uh. <laughs> uh, uh. Let me get over to the soundboard real quick. What? All right, go. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, grace, gra- you know, I, I really do. I think, I think, uh, church planner, it, here's the reality. You've got a, a huge amount of pressure on you. To perform, like whether you realize it or not, like let's say you're with an association or a denomination or a network, everybody always wants you to do that report. You know how many how many people came on site. You've got to report how many baptisms, how many conversions, how many you know how many gospel conversations. You 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 have a report. You got stuff you got to fill out, and there's that huge amount of pressure, Um, and and so you can feel bad about that. You can feel bad about my report sucks. You can feel bad about, I don't, I don't have time to really care for this church. <clears throat> Sorry, man. Something's up with my throat today. Um, which was fine before we started doing the podcast, which again, brings me to my next point. You're under a huge amount of spiritual attack at all times. You've got, you know, like, like Paul says, you've got pressures without, fears within. That was Paul's testimony. Um, and so Paul had this incredible pressure. And I don't think people realize when you're planning a church, there's all these unspoken things 
that nobody really talks about that you're juggling and you're dealing with. And then on top of that, if on top of that you're feeling under the gun from God and you don't know how to take care for yourself, then you're in trouble. I, I heard a great quote this morning from a buddy. He was at the uh, Sin Network orientation in Atlanta. And this guy said, beware the people that speak of, uh, that always talk about what they do and never about their soul. And, and, and that's a, that's a really important thing because your soul care ought to be your primary responsibility. Charles Spurgeon opens up lectures to my students with the quote, um, if any, he quotes Proverbs and I've mentioned this a million times because it stuck with me all my ministry. He says, if the art, if the ax be not sharp, the workmen must exert must much more force. And, and, and that chapter is called The Minister's Self-Watch. And he talks about caring for your soul. But that's your first job. Like, you cannot be successful in any true spiritual sense of the word without caring for your soul. Um, you, can, you can do the big launch. You can have hundreds of people on your first day. You can grow that to three, four, five hundred but if you don't care for your soul, it's it's a facade. And caring for your soul, believe it or not, is you know doing what Hebrews talks about, having your heart established in grace. That's why Hebrews says it is good that the heart be established in grace. And that word established means foundation. Everything else you're building on has to be built on this. I am a sinner. I am a screw up. I am a wreck. I am a walking disaster. I can't believe I even get to be in ministry. I mean, I think Pete and I, we realize like we're not in this podcast because we're awesome. Pete and I keep it very real that we don't deserve to do anything. Like we well, pray at well, the beginning speak, of speak every podcast. There. Speak about yourself there. I think I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty special. Yeah, it's true. I think so too. I think you're a, a regular snowflake. <laughs> we we should start every podcast just going, God, thank you that we get to do this. Like we know, and it's not because like I'm in some deep, dark, secret, you know, habitual sin or anything. But I know I'm a sinner. You look like you're going to say something right there. No, I was just going to say, amen. I know you're a sinner too. <laughs> yeah, Pete knows me pretty well after how many? Six, seven years, man. It's the uh, the year of completion we're approaching where you know me completely seven years. Um, but, you know, you, you do. You get to know people's weaknesses. Shoot, man, I, I, I annoy myself. I'm talking about being annoyed with everybody else. I get annoyed with me. I mean, you know. It, it woe unto me, you know, that's what Jesus said. Your, your constant attitude should be like the prayer God hears is it's a guy that just, he knows himself. He knows he doesn't deserve anything before God. And that's where Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, there's a difference between knowing I need God every second. I am a debtor to mercy alone, like, or a debtor to grace alone. Like the old hymn says of covenant mercy, I sing. Covenant mercy means God has bound himself to you. There's a binding covenant, right? Like he's attached to you. It's love that will not let me go. Of covenant mercy I sing. I receive, God bound himself to me through the blood of Jesus. And he's bound to me. He's bound himself because a covenant is a two-way agreement. Now you break that covenant nonstop. But the gospel is that God, not only when he enters a covenant with us, undertakes his side, the gospel, you you can't even be trusted to keep your end of the covenant. So God, who is the eternal covenant keeper, knows that we are the eternal perpetual covenant breakers. So the gospel is uh, God saying, you can't even be trusted to keep your end of the bargain. So I will send my son, who, while I keep my end of the bargain that all sin will be punished. Um, my son will come and he will keep the covenant on your behalf. He will literally um, live perfectly for you. And then he will die because, you know, hey, <laughs> there was 
a covenant broken repeatedly by you, and I will punish him. And that is the gospel. And so, believer, you have to preach the gospel um, to yourself. Of covenant mercy I sing. I can't sing about my awesomeness. I can't sing about even my ability to uh, uh, hold the covenant, even the covenant of faith. I suck at that. But Jesus had the faith necessary for me. And, and my, 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 my confession of faith is, I, I believe, Lord, help me in my unbelief. Even your faith does not save you. It says you are saved by grace through faith. Your faith doesn't save you. Faith is a vehicle. Grace saves you. And Jesus said, if you have just the faith of a mustard seed, it can move mountains. Like, not, it, it, even your faith can't be perfect. And, and God says, I, I receive that. Like, I, I, that's just amazing. Like, the gospel is absolutely amazing. And if Satan is trying to keep one thing from you guys, it's that. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, you, you remember, Pete, like, back in the early days, and this, this brings me to a really important point. You guys know that I'm radical on mission. Charlie Marquez was a guy that planted refuge Long Beach as, as my, you know, he and Julie planted with Andrew and I, they were like our co-planners and we made an agreement in the very beginning because Pete, uh, uh, Charlie was going through this grace revolution. All this stuff was hitting him and he was just coming on fire and that led him to want to plant a church that really preached grace. And I said, Hey brother, I'm, I think that's awesome. I'm totally down with that. Um, I'm going to have a slightly different bent, but, but here's what I've learned over the years. Um, I said, I will, I will mobilize them towards mission, but you can't mobilize people towards mission without breaking their heart with grace. The two go hand in hand. They fit each other perfectly. So if I come and I whoop up on a congregation, mission, 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 and I don't, so Charlie and I were tag teaming in the pulpit. We're trading off. Charlie would come and he'd preach grace and everybody would just be melted down. And then I would pick him up and say, right, now let's do something with that. Let's go on mission. And that was the tag team. So when people say like, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you guys know that I'm starting a core team training um, called jump school. Don't laugh, Pete. But <laughs> dude, <laughs> do, do, did everybody just hear that? Like he sends out this email. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm gonna do this new program. I'm gonna call it Jump School. I was Guess like, called? I was like, you've got to be kidding me. No one will have any idea what any program is at all. True, true. But it'll be called Jump School Core Team Training. So here's here's it's a, it's a mouthful, but here's the deal, man. It's it's like this. Um, it, when people ask, like, how do I train my core team? The thing that that my core team training doesn't have is it doesn't have the essential thing that you need in the, because what I say in it is look at some point during this training, either before, after, or midway through you, I would not reinvent what I think is the best core team training. They didn't intend it as a core team training, but I always give a shout out to this one product that's called gospel centered life. And I've, for years I've been saying, and I've, I've taken every cog that starts up through it. That's the first thing I, I put them through, gospel-centered life. Um, because that, to me, is like that's where it really puts the gospel in context and gives you a head-on collision with it in a way that will wreck you in a good way. And so um, every church plant, every church planner, I'm like, you got to start with your core team because if you don't – if, if you're kind of like, you know, I would say that the, the mission would be like, you know, if you're thinking of an engine, you, you got the pistons, that's mission, but the carburetor is the gospel, right? Like you got to have that, that manifold intake. You got to be sucking gas into the engine and, and the gospel is going to do that. The pistons, boom, 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 that's going to move you forward on, on mission, but you got to be pouring the gospel into people. Otherwise the car's not going to go. It's like a, you can have the most souped up engine in the world. You're like, Oh yeah, man, we got like Peyton Jones. He's training our team, you know, mission, mission. I'm reading Peyton's book. I'm reading this book, that book. doesn't matter. If your heart's not on fire, 
there's there's no catalytic converter. There's no combustion in your engine. You've got to have grace. That's why Hebrews is saying the foundation is grace. It's good that the heart be established in grace. And if that's true for your church, it's also true for you. If, if you're not on fire with the gospel, then a couple of things aren't going to happen. You're not going to glorify God. It's going to be about your church. My church, 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 church plant, church plant, church plant needs to be about Jesus. And it's only going to be about Jesus if you're in awe of him, if you're in love with him and what he's done for you and is doing for you and is going to do for people in the community is at the forefront. So, I mean, Pete, in a sense, you, you can look back on refuge and you can, you can remember it was like almost every other week there was this just beautiful gospel message. Right. And Charlie was, was primarily delivering those. Um, I don't remember what I had for dinner last night. You're asking me to remember back <laughs> to refuge long beach. Yeah. I don't, I have no idea. Sure. Sounds great though. No, but I would say that too. I would say that, um, I, I would say that, that really, if you guys are, are planning a church, make sure you're never far away from the gospel. The gospel ought to be going out. Yeah. You know, really you got to find Jesus in every passage that, that book, if you squeeze it, Jesus just oozes out. Um, I can't remember who it was that said, um, I, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Packer. I think he was quoting a rabbi, uh, Messianic, where he said that um, every every uh, book of the Bible is filled with Jesus. Every chapter of the Bible and every verse of the Bible and every uh, uh, word in the Bible and every letter and jot and tittle of the Bible, and eventually every space be between those 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 characters, every bit of it is packed and crammed with Jesus. I mean, that was the Holy Spirit's intention in like writing that book. What's that? So that doesn't sound like a rabbi. <laughs> well, it was a messianic. Oh, okay. And and those guys, man. I mean, shoot, can they? Can they just squeeze Jesus out of everything? It's incredible. Well, you know, interestingly enough, they have a unique understanding if they were a later in life convert to Messianic. Yes. Dude, I used to go down to Adat Hamashiach in Irvine back when I was young. I was in this phase where I would go listen to everyone I could when I was younger. And I, I used to go to this, uh, it was on Saturday, and I would go to this Messianic church. And holy crap. Do I remember this guy opening up Daniel and guys in my denomination back then would always preach Daniel. But this dude, I had never heard an exposition like this totally different from the premillennial, um, you know, dispensational, uh, exposition that, that is become kind of mainstream in America. But I went, Whoa, I don't know what just happened to me. You just rocked me in new theology. On, on on the book of Daniel. It was incredible, dude. Hmm. And it, it was the start for me of going, huh, maybe I don't understand this stuff. You know, like maybe Dallas Seminary doesn't have the final word on. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm a Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> That's dude, an old sound bite. We're going to get to heaven and be like, oh, the Seventh-day Adventists had it right all along. <laughs> So, yeah, man, I mean, and so, guys, you know, how, how you can, you know, there's a couple of things. Keep in the Word. Just keep in the Word. You're going you're gonna to see Jesus. And I know that's like a yeah, duh. But I remember years ago when, when my pastor, um, he, he uh, committed a moral failure. And he asked me, he said, hey, Peyton, you know, look, I called me up. And it was, it was really, I still ad- admire him. And respect that he did this so much because I was this young, like 20 year old assistant pastor and he called me up and it wasn't easy for him. Like when he fell, I remember um, they, they he was meeting with the board and he said, I just don't want to see Peyton. That's that's it. I just don't like he couldn't look me in the eye like mm-hmm. he knew like, I don't know, like I think he felt like I let him down, you know, I probably wrecked him this and that. And um, but he called me up like two weeks later. And he said, uh, hey, I owe it to you to 
have a chat with you and let's go to, let's go to lunch. I wasn't mad at him. I loved him. And it, you know, I, my heart was breaking for him. And he said, look, um, let's, let's go to Coco's. Um, you know, so I, I go and meet him. He was, he was, he was quite a personality. He, he pulls up in a, in a giant charter bus. <laughs> he was driving buses and uh, he pulls up and the, the, the door opens. And he gets out. And he's like, Hey, <laughs> And uh, we go to lunch, and it, it was really sad because you know it is is it was a very 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 I can't even get into how tragic of a story it would turn out to be. Um, just I not just his life, but so many lives mm. wrecked and destroyed. And I remember he he said to me, you know, ask me anything you want, and I said. I just, I need to know, like, what happened? Like, what took you out? Like, like, I never, like, you had so much wisdom. It was like he had the wisdom of Solomon. And that has always stuck with me that far better men than me have have fallen to sexual sin and scandal. I know we tend to look down our, you know, David did. Um, you know, uh, I just think some of these guys in the Bible that were, were spiritual heavyweights, um, they, they were broken men like us. And I will never forget what he said to me. He said, Peyton, at a certain point, I stopped reading the Bible for my own soul. And I thought it was enough to read it as a textbook for my sermon. Mm. And, and I have noticed over the years that can become a danger for me. Because a lot of what I do, I'm, I, I have to be immersed in the word, but I have had to keep my scripture reading as a personal journey as well. And the people that I notice that are spirit filled, they're constantly talking about what they've been learning in the scripture. And I know they're not like when I was at Nam um, with Mac Lake. Mac was always talking about something God said to him that morning in the word. And in and, and that, and I started noticing people that I could, you could just tell they're walking with God. It was that they were walking with him in his word and their hearts were burning. Like it says on the road to Emmaus and, and you're never going to go far from the grace and heart of God when you're in the word. So like um, right now I'm doing a study through Genesis, um, and I'm doing it, 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 this is an assignment that I'm doing where um, I'm 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 starting a podcast for through the Word, and it's it's a through the Word format that's called Bible Ninja, and so I'm in the process of recording. I got to build a pretty big backlog. I mean, we all you know, long time listeners will know that I did Leviticus. Uh, but now I'm going through Genesis, Exodus, I'm doing all that. And then I'll catch up to Deuteronomy and yada, yada numbers. <clears throat> and but I'm just going through the Bible. Everybody, it's where you take eight minutes to explain a chapter of the Bible. And so you go through the whole thing that way. Yeah. And it's it's funny. It's humorous. It's poignant. It's it's kind of like a, a mini exposition. You can't fully exposit a passage in, in eight minutes of the whole chapter, but it's like a mini exposition. It gives you enough to go back and, and dig in on your own and 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 wrestle with things. Um, but it's huge. And so, um, but even recently, like I was just reading about um, Cain, you know, like the incredible mercy of God, even with Cain, that God warns him. And then after he commits this horrendous murder, God makes him a wanderer, but still protects him. And says, I'll avenge anyone who kills you. And it's like, even in that passage alone, I don't think I'd ever seen before how much it was Jesus where um, Abel, the very first murder ever committed, was someone very Christ-like and innocent who was murdered by somebody who wasn't. And yet God covered over that sin and, and, and atones for it and puts a protection on him and shields him from the wrath that, you know, because Cain says, anyone who finds me will kill me. And even, even in that, 
there's the gospel. Because the Bible repeatedly goes back to the blood of Abel, and it mentions it. You know, here uh, you've got like this this guy who's offering a lamb who becomes a lamb, and it's just I don't. I'm not explaining it very well. <laughs> I explain it a lot better on that, but even then, and I make the crack like, how's that for this wrathful God of the Old Testament? You know, you you see this mercy of God running all throughout the Scripture, and um, it just it just was incredible to me. You know, um, here's, here's what I, <clears throat> here's what I say, luring him into the field. Uh, Cain kills him ironically, like a lamb led to slaughter because he's a shepherd, um, Abel an innocent here is made a sacrifice with a backwards motive to please God, becoming a picture of what we do to Christ. God's true man from the Lord. Cause Abel, when, when Eve gets him, she says, I have received the man from God. She remembers that God tells a serpent. That, you know, you're going to have one who reverses the curse. So when she has uh, Cain, she thinks this is the Messiah. And of course, um, then Abel's born. And Cain, rather than turning out to be the Messiah, becomes pretty much like the devil, right? He, he becomes this one who, like, wreaks this horrible havoc on creation. God's like, you've actually polluted the creation. now. His, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. And, um, so it, it's just really interesting to me that, that God confronts him and he, he, even his punishment is laced with, um, with mercy. Mm. And, and so I, I, yeah, I just, I, I, it's amazing to me. Um, and, and anywhere you, you go in the word, the other thing is, uh, what Tozer used to say, Tozer used to preach the gospel to himself. Lloyd Jones used to say the exact same thing. I preach to myself. So when you've preached to others, you can preach the most passionate gospel message. And human psychology is such, and Jordan Peterson touches on this a bit, that um, we will go at great lengths to take care of our dogs and give them medicine and antibiotics faithfully. When the doctor gives you antibiotics, you don't take it. So we really suck at self-care. And, and what Jordan Peterson as a psychologist comes down to is we know ourselves very well. And so we don't value ourselves because we don't respect ourselves because we know us too well. And so he says that psychologically leads to a lack of self-care because we don't value ourselves like we do someone else who we don't know as well. Like a dog, um, dogs seem innocent to us. So we... We, we care for them, you know, but hey, for ourselves. Hey, dogs are innocent. <laughs> and, and it's the same with other people. We will go to great lengths, you know, even like it says, you know, for, you know, we, we, we'll die for a, for a just man. You know, we, we, when we value other people, we will lay ourselves down. And, and though for a good man, you know, no one would die for it, Paul says, or someone you know, was scared. It's, it's funny you say it like that because I can totally see that. Like, there's almost no one who I've ever met who I've thought to myself, oh, God couldn't forgive that person. Right. But yet when you know yourself, you're you're like I said before at the beginning of the, the podcast, you know, there's that shame of, you know, God uh, screwed up again today. Uh, you know, how, how could you possibly keep forgiving me every day? You know, it's like, yeah, so I, I could totally yeah. see that. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that, you know. Um, God knows us so much better than ourselves. Even when we think we're doing awesome, it's like, oh, those motives may not have been right. I, I think there's so much more sin in us than we ever realize. Like, oh, for geez, example, yeah. like Cain, um, going back to that, where Cain, you know, he, he sacrifices to God. Like I'll meet Christians sometimes who are like, oh yeah, I do this cause, and I obey cause I don't want to, I don't want to upset my blessing. You know, it's not much better than Cain, who's like, yeah, I, I just want the blessing, so I'll just give my vet. The, the Bible says that he didn't give it by faith. Hebrews comments on it and says he, for what he gave was not given in faith. It was more out of like, kind of like a works, like an exchange, like, what are you going to give me? And so that's why he's upset when, you know, his sacrifice, doesn't, and he's like, well, you're accepting Abel's. I think Abel's just like, God, I don't expect anything from you, but... 
I just love you, and thanks for making me, and you deserve everything. He just gives it in faith. He doesn't care what God does with it. It's not like a prosperity gospel. I think Cain, I think all prosperity gospel comes out of that thing, like, I give you this, God, and you give me back this. And and, and that's, it's just not received. Like, God's like, that's not faith. Mm. Faith is is, you just give to me, and just knowing whether I do something for you, Or I don't do something like, you know, Anna and I, most of our lives, we gave our lives as missionaries, we this, we that, and we can't have a baby. The most natural thing for a couple, can't have a baby. Now, do I go to God and go, hey, God, but I gave my life for you. You know, I I did like you owe me. Like that's that's something that's very tempting because we forget. But here's here's the reality. Like so much of what I do can be laced with with the sacrifice of Cain. It could just be laced with, uh, God, I'm doing this. You owe me this. Or you said this, so you must give me that. Like, it's just, I don't, I don't know if that's clear of what I'm saying. But I, I think there's just so much sin rampant in us that we just focus on, well, I looked at this and I shouldn't have. Or I said this and I shouldn't have. Or I felt this way and I shouldn't have. And, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, that's not, I don't even think that's the real evil sin in our hearts. Hmm. And so (laughs) what I'm saying is it's not even the sin we see that that God's forgiving. It's the sin that we don't see, you know, because the Pharisee was using this criteria. Like I don't do this and I don't do that. And God's like, that's not even, that's not even righteousness. You know, righteousness comes from God. It's given to you because you can't earn it. And so I, w- what I'm talking about with Lloyd-Jones is you can you can give the gospel to other people as a minister, as a church planner, and you don't preach it to yourself. You know, it's like giving the dog the antibiotics, but but not taking your own. And you got to make sure you're taking your antibiotics. You got to make sure that you're preaching. So what Lloyd-Jones would do is when he was getting ready in the morning, because he wasn't a great prayer in the morning. He was an afternoon prayer. And he'd say, I just, I waste time in the morning if I try to pray then. So he would set time aside in the afternoon to be alone with God. And you can do that, you know. Um, the, the golden rule is know thyself. But Lloyd-Jones would literally, as he was getting ready, he's brushing his teeth, he's looking in the mirror, he would preach all the things that God said to him, all of God's promises. He would look at himself in the mirror and say, you're good enough, you're smart enough. Doggone it. People like, like you. you. <laughs> What's funny is most of our listeners will have no idea what that means. Yeah, yeah tell them, Pete. Uh, that's just from Saturday Night Live. Yeah, what was that guy's name? It was something Smalley, wasn't it? Well, uh, yeah, all I know is it's the guy who uh, became a senator and then recently uh, resigned for... Was it Al Franken? Yeah, him. Yeah, he, he had this thing where he would look in the, he'd do this self-help routine. And he'd go, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. But he was like and, supposed to be... <clears throat> The psychologist giving everyone else like good advice, but he was the one who needed it the most. <laughs> exactly. And and that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, isn't it isn't it that the, the the worker is the first to receive the the share of the crops, the farmer, the hardworking farmer? That's what Paul's saying is you need to be the first partaker of what it is you're farming here, the gospel. You're the first one to receive the share. You've got to eat of this gospel too. Um, you you can't let it just be for everyone else. And so soul care, like I said, Lloyd-Jones would look in the mirror and, and he would preach the gospel to himself. He'd preach, he'd be like, hey, you, guy standing in the mirror, God loves you. And he wouldn't say it, like, don't talk to yourself, your family think you're crazy. But he would he would look at himself and, and tell himself, God loves you. He gave his son for you. He redeemed you from death and hell. Like, he's he's made a covenant with you that he keeps both sides of. Like, you need to be telling yourself that and you need to be reading or listening to things on the go, like sermons, um, gospel sermons. You need to be being preached to as well, because if you believe in preaching and you're not letting people preach to you, then you're in danger because you need it too. You need to have people preaching to your soul as well. That's probably all we have time for. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, 
it's uh, it's definitely food for thought. You know, it. One of the thoughts I had, and it's it's slightly off subject, so I I even wondered to bring it up, but since I already started on this path, I'm gonna finish off the thought anyway. And that is, uh, I find it really interesting that the tenth commandment is kind of like to me, it's the checkmate commandment, right? Oh. Thou shalt not covet. Yeah. And if you think about, hmm. like everything else is, you know, outward, right? You know, uh, don't steal, don't murder, uh, love the Lord your God. It, it's it's all outward, but then the I call it the checkmate because it's like okay. Now let's look at what's going on inside you. Mm. And that's the part to me where it's like, okay, prosperity gospel, that fails the checkmate. Because <laughs> right. the whole thing is about, oh, I want that. you know. Um, but even if you look at uh, when Jesus said, hey, you know, I tell you, if you look at a woman uh, and lust after her, you've committed adultery. Right. Well, it's also, I mean... If they thought about it back in the Old Testament, it's like, well, yeah, that's the Tenth Commandment. I'm coveting a woman that's not mine. Yeah. Um, but it's it's just absolutely that, it's just that that checkmate. And when you really look at yourself and you realize there's that checkmate, you know, one there, it's like, man, that that's why for me, Psalm sixteen two is my my life verse. You know, I say to the Lord, there's no good in me apart from you. Cause I know the checkmate, man. I know what's going on inside of me, and there's there's no good in me apart from God. Mm. Yeah, you know, and it, it's so funny, man, because that's the very sin when Paul goes, "When I thought I was yeah. okay, yeah, that one was my undoing. That's what the Holy Spirit used. I don't know what he was coveting. You know, it's really because he never says what he just goes. I found within me every covetous and evil desire." And you're like, wow, Paul, that's, that's, that's like, I'm, I'm always amazed too. like, when we were talking earlier about, you know, stop trying to pretend you got it all together as a leader. Cause you're just proving to your people that grace hasn't hit your heart when you do that. You just, you know, cause you're not to use the grace as a guy. Ah, well, I'm covered by grace. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know, you're just like <laughs> being super carnal, but let people know you're a failure, you know, like don't, don't try to pretend you're not or they will it because the gospel hasn't truly blown through and saturated your fellowship. You need to make sure there's an atmosphere of grace. It graces the air everyone breathes. And I'm just always amazed like Paul, when he's just like, look, this is, this is Paul, man, like woe unto me, you know, who will rescue me from this? Praise be to, thanks be to God, who through our Lord Jesus Christ, like, that's got to be your constant dichotomy. That, <laughs> who, woe unto me, who's going to rescue me? But I've got, thanks be to God, who sent Jesus. Like, I, I've got the gospel. Like, the world can hear that from us. What the world can't hear is the Pharisee, right? The guy who tries to pretend he's got all the, is there quick to point out our sins, right? Remember when the, the, uh, the, the gay marriage thing was going on, you know, all those debates, they're quick to point out, hey, you guys are no better than us. And we should beat them to the punch. We should always be beating the world to the punch. We ought to be confessing on a regular basis. Hey, I don't have it all together. People can hear whatever you say next. I was just talking to a barber this week who um, he, he leads people to, to, to Christ in his barber chair here in, in Oceanside. We've been talking about possibly starting up a church in a, in a, in a, uh, grabbing a space together and doing a, a church with this ginormous, but he's like one of those vintage hipster. Um, he's been in it for like 20 years, 25 years, but, um, he's old school, but you know, we've been talking about maybe sharing space and he was just saying, yeah, I mean, but that's how I start everything. I tell him, I don't, cause he goes, when I first started this, he goes, and it, it reminded me of you, Pete. Um, he goes, when I first started this, the, one of my pastors, um, he, uh, he came to work for me. Um, his church plant kind of dwindled and he, uh, he goes, I, I didn't want to hire him because I, I, I knew what a sinner I was. And I, I thought, man, I don't know, like, I don't know if he'll be able to hang in this barbershop, you know, and he hires his pastor 
And this pastor starts like, he goes, first off, the pastor fit right in. Of course, he was a church planner, right? He goes, but everything started changing. Like the atmosphere in my barbershop started transforming. He goes, because what happened was, you know, all of a sudden my guy started going, hey, hey, brother, will you, will you pray? And he goes, they weren't walking with Jesus yet. And he's like, they're like, hey, uh, will, will, you, will you pray for me for this? And he goes, and they all started coming to faith. And he goes, now my barbershop's like this old powerhouse. And we're still very real. But first thing I tell people is, hey, you know, I, I don't got it all together. But he goes, but we've all changed. It's rad. And he goes, it's ministry. When I, when, when I left this dude, um, I told my buddy who hooked up the meeting, I said, that dude's a minister. Like, gone are the days where it's like, you tell that guy, hey, you got you to gotta leave your nets. You got you to gotta drop the barbershop and go, go be a pastor and tell other Christians how to live. You just keep doing what you're doing, brother. You know, that's, that's, he's leading people to faith. He's discipling people. He's helping guys that, that have no other way. And to me, I'm like, that's, that's, that just sounds like my next church plant, you know? Hmm. So, but anyways, guys, uh, thanks for joining us today. Pete, while you're, while you're busy, um, preaching all that grace to yourself, um, what, what do you, these segues never are good. Um, <laughs> I was like, where are you going? I totally but forgot. How, how do you, how do you look after the financial needs of your church? You know, I'm so grateful that you asked that question, Peyton, because I've been wanting to share about this for, for quite some time. <laughs> it's a great little organization called simplifychurch.com, And you head on over to simplifychurch.com and you ask Josh Henry for some help. And I tell you him and his team, they take care of all your needs, payroll, taxes, IRS compliance. You need a website built, they're there. You need an assistant, they'll help you hire one. These guys are incredible. Yeah, simplifychurch.com. Be sure to check them out. Guys, thanks for joining us for the podcast today. This has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell reminding you, if you want to reach the ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do what nobody's doing. I'm sorry, Mr. Paul Mitchell. I've dialed the wrong number. I'm trying to reach a granddaughter. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Church